And now is the time for the true highlight of our service this morning. As our speaker today, Reverend Michael Record, a well-known wordsmith who needs really no introduction. So I give you Reverend Michael, my fortis brother. <laughs> Thank you, Vance. Good morning, children of the universe, no less than the trees and the stars. You have a right to be here, desiderata. And thanks to, and salutations to those listening to me online, it's a wonderful day to give thanks and be glad. The title of this talk is Hello Challenge, Come On In. <laughs> By the time I finish, in 20 minutes if you're lucky, I'd like you to have the feeling that about positive things, about adversity, I want you to agree with the world's most quoted author, William Shakespeare, that, and I quote, sweet are the uses of adversity. To put it less poetically and in the Jamaican language, if life gives you a lemon, you can make lemonade. Let's start off by seeing what other frequently quoted personalities say about Again, a Jamaican expression, hard time, which is another name for adversity. Nelson Mandela declared, I never lose. I either win or lose, learn. Don't you just love that? He doesn't even regard a negative, quotes unquote, situation as negative because he learns from it. And if you learn, how could it be negative? Whatever it is. Then there's Martin Luther King Jr. who stated, I quote, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that, unquote. His answer to negative relationships, and of course negative relationships is a major type of adversity, is to love the enemy. And we know that Jesus also suggests that approach. Then there's Jack Canfield, author of the Chicken Soup series of inspirational books. He has a longish quote. Here it is. Successful people maintain a positive focus in life, no matter what is going on around them. They stay focused on their past successes rather than their past failures, and on the next action steps they need to take to get them closer to the fulfillment of their goals, rather than all the other distractions, adversities, that life presents to them. That's Jack Canfield. And here's another from a man who all right-thinking people admire. That excludes 80% of Fox News. <laughs> I'm talking about Barack Obama. About transforming adversity, he says, change will not, will not come if we wait for some other people or some other time. We are the ones we have been waiting for. We are the change that we seek." Unquote. We, he says, must effect the change. Don't wait on someone else to do it. And a lot of people do make that mistake. They feel that they are powerless to change the situation they are in, whether a personal situation or a societal one. They forget that they are connected to an infinite power. 
God. And that change often begins with one person and always with one step. You'd think that getting fired for, was a tragedy, wouldn't you? And I don't mean getting fired from a small job in a tiny company. I mean from a billion dollar company and fired from the top position. Well, the man that, that happened to is Steve Jobs of Apple. And when he got fired, he declared, I didn't see it then, but it turned out that getting fired from Apple was the best thing that could have happened to me. The heaviness of being successful was replaced by the lightness of a beginner again, less sure about everything, it freed me to enter one of the most creative periods of my life, unquote. And he was fired from Apple, which he founded. Now, let's hear from perhaps the most successful of the women of all time, Oprah Winfrey. She made it big against all the odds, as most of us know from sexual abuse and poverty. She rose to become a world-famous talk show host, owner of a television channel and media company. In the field of radio, talk shows, media, philanthropy, her achievements are remarkable. She made a difference in the world by bringing the concept of self-improvement, spirituality, empowerment, to millions and millions in entertaining ways. She was so inspiring that I'm going to quote her four, four times. One, I believe, she says, that every single event in life, every single event is an opportunity to choose love over fear. Second, I trust that Everything happens for a reason, even if we are not wise enough at the time to see it. Three, challenges are gifts that force us to search for a new center of gravity. Don't fight them, just find a new way to stand. And four, you get to know who you really are in a crisis. Of course, I couldn't end a list of quotations without including a couple of Jamaican sayings. I found both of them a little tricky. Think of about how you would interpret them and then match the answers with the ones that I got online. First Jamaican saying, when cloud casts shadow, sun no set. Think about what that means. And the other one, hungry make monkey blow fire. <laughs> How would you interpret that? Okay, first one, when cloud cast shadow sun a set. Listen to the proper English. The fact that a cloud is casting a shadow means that the sun is still shining. So there's hope for getting out of any bad situation. Is that what you had interpreted? Good. This one, hungry make monkey blow fire. When people are in need, they are forced to become resourceful and learn new skills. Blow fire. <laughs> you know? Most of the time, monkey will pick the banana and pick the apple and pick, you know, the fruit. But now he has to be forced to learn to cook the food and it blows a fire. Think, think of a coal pot. <laughs> now, now I'll tell you two stories. Both published in the Sunday Observer a couple of years ago about two young Jamaicans whose thinking is in line with the above quotations. May I first introduce Tahira Williams, 
currently a science student at Howard University. She was born and raised in the hills of Gordontown. Life was a challenge, for the family was poor. So at Grove Primary, she was placed on the government program of advancement through health and education. We call it PATH, a subsistence program. She was that poor. Now she heard that Campion College provided possibly the best academic training. And when she sat her grade six achievement test, she wrote down Campion at the top of her list of schools of choice. Also on the list of this ambitious young woman living in poverty in Gordentown were St. Andrew High, Woolmer's Girls, and Immaculate Conception. Ambitious Pickney. She wants the best. She's not focusing on her poverty. Not surprisingly, considering this positive thinking and hard work, she earned a place at Campion College. But she was still poor. How could she afford to take up the offer when her father, the breadwinner of the family, had been laid off recently from his job, job with the Jamaican Urban Transit Company? She was urged by friends and others to seek a less financially demanding school and was even offered a scholarship to attend the Queen's School, a really good school. But she was adamant. She wanted to attend the Campion. And she had the support of her mother, who she said would always remind her of how great God is and how faith could open doors. Quotes. My mother believes in God. She has so much faith. She would always tell me, God will not let you start something good and leave you alone. So I kept that belief, Tahira said. What are the lessons here? Keep your eye on the goal. Keep your faith in God strong. Miracles can happen. And a miracle did happen. Out of the blue, August 20, 2007, Tahira's mother received a call from her grade six teacher who said that a UK woman wanted to assist a student in need. The teacher suggested Tahira. The woman, a good Samaritan, we can call her, had no prior ties with the school and had merely called wanting to help someone in need. And Tahira is still being assisted by this nameless Samaritan whose only demand for continued assistance was that she did her best. Here's Tahira. It really affected me a lot because I didn't like myself. From first form into second form, I asked myself questions like, why aren't you smart enough? Why are you so black? Note, it was not the school administration, but a small group of students who mocked her, calling her to, causing her to feel inferior. Fortunately, that self-doubt was temporary, obviously not her true nature. Nearing the end of second form, she decided she wasn't going to allow anyone to bully her anymore. And that was when school began to get better. Change your thinking. Change your life. She started playing sports, using it as an escape route from all the hard work, academic work she had to do. Think about that. In third form, she recalled life becoming easier, even though she added football and basketball to her already full extracurricular activities. As if she didn't get enough exercise traveling to and from school. You see, she had to go from Gordontown. She had to go down a hill, across a river, up another hill, 
And when it rained, access to her house was impossible because the river flooded. And she had to travel a different route around yet another hill. But she kept on going to school. And all that exercise made her good at sports, built her muscles, and you'll soon see how that worked out. In fifth form, she faced the challenge of her beloved sister becoming seriously ill with lupus. Tahira says, it was difficult because I couldn't help her. I didn't want to think that she might die. She had to stay in bed most of the time. It was difficult to go home and study and to prepare for exams, knowing that she was in bed ill. And here, Tahira shows love for others and trust in God again. She said, when she was in the hospital, I prayed, I asked God to allow her to come back to us. But I would pray mostly for strength because I know God is in control of everything. And if it is his will that she goes, then I accept that. But she did come back to us. In fifth form, Tahira obta obtained nine CX subjects with seven distinctions, two credits. In sixth form, she obtained all five subjects she attempted at Cape, gaining four distinctions and a credit. Little poor girl from Gordontown. So at that stage now, sixth form, she had to consider whether she should move on to further studies or go get a work. She thought of perhaps foregoing a year at university and work and save towards going to fur further education. And then she remembered hearing about AIM, A-I-M, Educational Service, an agency that provides college and graduate school placement services, as well as the Scholastic Aptitude Test, the SAT, it's S-A-T, preparations for those who wanted to attend university in the United States. And it was that, remembering AIM, that made her start thinking, why don't I study overseas? And that meant doing the SAT preparation course that AIM offered and possibly getting a scholarship. But her parents and sister would have to pay 600 US dollars for the AIM services. They didn't have the 600 US dollars. Time for another miracle, right? Tahira's mother gets this random phone call from a family friend who wanted to know whether Tahira, who she had heard was getting good grades, was going to sit the sats for studying in America. She had no prior knowledge that Tahira wanted to study abroad. So her mother says, yes, she's thinking about doing the SAT. And the friend, the family friend told Tahira's mother that she would pay the 600 US dollars. Beaming with excitement as she spoke to the Observer reporter, Tahira explained her preparations for the SAT and her intention to get good enough results to apply to several universities. As it turned out, some of them offered half scholarships but Tahira needed a full one, as she did not want to burden her family with finding any more money to further her education. And she wanted, she said, to go to Howard University in Washington, DC, because of its history, and because, I quote, it had predominantly black people. But Howard was one of the universities that had not responded. And can you believe it? Tahira refused all the offers that she got of the half scholarship. And guess what? She received an email offer of entry from Howard long after the other offers had come. She appealed to Howard for a scholarship. And because of all she had achieved under adverse circumstances, you see how things come full circle, because of all her hardships she was offered the full scholarship. One called a capstone scholarship, and this covered boarding, tuition, and other fees. 
Sweet are the uses of adversity, right? Because of her suffering, she got that particular scholarship. But, there's always a but. This scholarship amounted to only 31,000 US, and this was $5,000 short of what she would need to fully cover her expenses. She applied to Howard for a further scholarship, a sports scholarship this time, not the academic, another academic one. And after AIM had lobbied on her behalf, she was given not the 5,000 she needed, but 8,000 from Howard for the sports grants. We know that we are not to limit the university, eh? and that is why Tahira is now at Howard University reading for a degree in biology. And she plans to give back in the way that she had received, that is, she's going to give scholarships to needy students. Now, let me introduce the second person. Eric Solke, the first person ever inducted into the JPS Foundation Leadership Academy. And this is a program to identify youth leaders and groom, groom them for positions of even higher leadership. He was the winner of the 2013 Governor General's Award for Youth Leadership. He got the JPS Foundation Scholarship in 20, 2007 to study for a double major in pure and applied chemistry. And then later he started medical studies. But it wasn't always smooth sailing for this future general surgeon. He grew up in an abusive home, relocated several times as a child, and even got into trouble with the law while a student at Vax Vauxhall High School. Eric's grip, gripping saga is filled with all the elements of a tragedy. The Rollington Town native was a witness to, victim of, and a participant in many acts that were on the wrong side of the law. His mother, who was regularly beaten up by an often drunk father, was arrested for fraud when he was a child. And then a domino effect followed a series of residential moves which impacted negatively on his primary level education. And when he eventually entered Vauxhall, he got caught up with a group of juvenile delinquents, and soon he and his friends were facing fraud charges. The turning point in his life came after an incident which could have sent him to prison. I went home, he said, that night, disgusted with myself, thinking of taking a man's life for a mere $50. I realized I needed to change and fast if I wanted to become someone worth re respecting. His uncle, a doctor, helped to make the change happen. He says, my uncle moved me from Vauxhall to St. George's College, which I entered in third form and finished at the top of my class that year. In fourth form, I got the highest grade in biology. In fifth form, I graduated with the highest grade in mathematics. His CXC results were equally impressive. Eight subjects, including ones and twos, as were his A-levels. He was the first student in the college to get grade one in Cape Two chemistry. His other achievements include being on the dean's list for outstanding performance in exams at UWI. And listen to what he says about his adversities. Quotes, my achievements so far are somewhat due to my struggles, the strength I have gained from my experiences, and the perseverance I have developed. I never let my circumstances get in my way of dreaming, and I do dream big. Looking back to where I have been and to where I am today, I'm not sorry that day when the police took away my mother. Yes, it started a chain of events in my life, but it also made me the man I am today. I'm going to be a doctor. There is no doubt about that." Unquote. Now, 
20 minutes gone. So I'm about to conclude the middle section of my talk and begin to approach the start of my journey to the end. So let's now look at how science of mind deals with adversity. In the Science of Mind textbook, page 266, in the chapter on the principles of successful living, Dr. Ernest Holmes, founder of Science of Mind, states, quotes, lessons on prosperity and mental control of conditions are sometimes dangerous because of the misunderstanding of the subject. Science of mind is not a get-rich-quick scheme. Neither does it promise something for nothing. It does, however, promise the one who will comply with its teachings that he shall be able to bring greater possibilities and happier conditions into his life. We do not teach that you get what you want. If we could get all we want, it might be disastrous. For it is certain that most of us would want things that would interfere with the well-being of someone else." Unquote. He later continues, we not only believe, but we know that it is entire possible, po entirely possible sorry, through mental treatment, through right thought and belief, to greatly influence our environment, its reaction to us, the situations we meet, and the conditions we contact. There is such a thing as demonstrating a control of conditions. This is in our Declaration of Principles. We shall be able to prove this in such degree as we are successful in looking away from the conditions which now exist while accepting better ones. Note that you should turn your gaze away from the adversity and look to the good that you desire. Science of mind does tell us that if we comply with the law, the law complies with us. No man can demonstrate peace while clinging to unhappiness. He can demonstrate resignation and call it peace, but it will not be peace. No man can jump into the water and remain dry. This is contrary to law and reason." Unquote. So how do we turn our gaze away from the adversity that is in front of us? Here's what Dr. Holmes says. The science of mind is based upon the su supposition that we are surrounded by a universal mind into which we think. And we think into this as we think into this universal mind, we set a law in motion which is creative and which contains within itself a limitless possibility. The whole teaching of Jesus was based on the theory that we are surrounded by an intelligent law which does unto us each as he believes. And in order to make a demonstration, we must have a mental equivalent of the thing we desire. So there's science of man's answer. You look away from the adversity by seeing it differently. You, do, you create the picture of the mental equivalent, what you want, and think that picture into universal mind, which responds by law and replaces the adversity out there with the new image in your head. So I'll wrap up the package for you. In this package, you have the advice of Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King Jr., Oprah, Steve Jobs, Barack Obama, Jack Canfield, Jamaican Old Time Proverbs, Tahira, Eric, and Dr. Ernest Holmes on how to use adversity. Pick one. Pick more than one. 
They all work. Namaste.